right, hello everyone. Hopefully I'm visible and things are good, and this time I didn't biff my pre-roll for the stream. Oh, hopefully everyone's had a good week. Well, it's Tuesday, so there hasn't been much of a week yet, but that has its own positives. Plenty of time to turn the week around if it hasn't been great. Plenty of time to plan out some more crafts. This week on Paint and Time, I'm going to be talking about tenacity and completion. So we're going to be talking about finishing pro projects. Um, I don't really think that I'm going to be able to finish any models on stream, but I'm going to do the most important thing, which is to work towards that finishing. Uh, hopefully I'll even get the brush on the models before an hour in. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to offer that uh, every week's a good week with the right attitude, MJ Cracker says. Yeah, that's basically correct. It's all about perspective. Boy, this week's going to make next week look great in comparison uh, is a thing you can tell yourself. And sometimes it's even true. Uh, so when it comes to completing models, uh, first of all, even if you're not completely satisfied with each part of your paint job, more paint, any paint, finished paint is better than no paint always, every time. Uh, even something that you've kind of started is better than something you never started at all, uh, especially when you're looking to put it on the table or say something interesting with model. Paint is good. Uh, in my opinion, techniques are a bit easier to practice than patience and tenacity itself. So I recommend that you're more jealous of your opportunities to practice those tougher skills. Uh, that's right, I called patience and tenacity skills. Uh, think of your tolerance for doing things over a long period of time, kind of a muscle that you're trying to train or a ditch that you're trying to dig in your brain. And only a little bit of steady application is going to make that muscle stronger or make that ditch de deeper. But, uh, boy, practicing regular painting skills? Once you've got a skill in mind, you can just hit it. You can be like, I want to try this on this model, and this model, and this model. I want to try Zenithal highlighting on this guy, and this guy, and I want to try glazing on this guy and that guy. Uh, And if you experiment with enough techniques, you might find things that help come together as part of sort of a language of your miniatures and a way of uh, developing more speed in your painting or something that gives you a more finished look that you're more satisfied with. Um, sometimes when you finish a model and you have things later on that you find that you're unsatisfied later, and that can point you to the techniques that you want to master in the future. Um, let's see, is this guy dry? This guy's dry. Here is Gorman de Wolf again. Now, on the little guys hanging from his belt here, you can see, if I get the light correctly, you can see that I've kind of painted on some light effects. These guys are a little bit harder to spotlight because they're, you know, they're round cylinders. There could be a lot of different point light sources. I figured I would just go kind of crazy with it because they're alchemical substances. So maybe they're, you know, bubbling within and that's moving the light around. Um, I haven't decided what this guy is going to be. The, the third one here, the one on the left. Um, I think I'm going to paint that guy yellow. But if anybody's got a better idea, go ahead and call it out in the chat. But uh, 
I'm not going to redo it on this model, but it makes me want to rethink how I do point light reflections and so on on models. It's definitely something that I maybe should have done with a reference. But that is okay, because it shows me that I have a few things left to learn. When you make mistakes on a model, even when you make mistakes in real life, that's often a sign that you're growing, you're stretching yourself. You're doing something that isn't a guarantee. So don't take mistakes as a sign of failure. Take mistakes as a sign of deeper effort on your part. Yeah, no, I, I love a lot of the War Machine minis. Um, I used to have some armies, I used to have a mercenaries army and I used to have a retribution army uh, but I sold them before moving out to Denver a couple years ago and like it was the right choice I still kind of regret it I kind of miss my boys but I don't play those games I just love the models a lot I don't love the models $50 every five months a lot but you know they're really cool they're very cool. They have a very rich world. They've had a lot of development, a lot of talented sculptors. So I love that they're still around and kicking and making even more absurd stuff. I will say though, uh, the way I painted my Retribution Army was a mistake. And I think I have grown from it. Because uh, I looked at the box art and I was like, Oh yeah, cool. So they're kind of doing a reverse menacing thing with with the white sheen paint and then the greenish glow. You know, it's it looks positive when you're just going by color palette clichés, but they've managed to make it look pretty menacing here. But I want to go classic menace. So black glossy armors, red glows on the orbs. Um but I still primed white. That was dumb. I should not have primed white. Even gray would have been significantly better, but uh, I, should, I should have primed black on that army. War Machine is never a mistake. I mean, you're not wrong, but with my painting that time, I can admit to myself, I didn't do it the way I probably should have done it. I made things a lot harder on myself, which made that black finish on that armor look uh, just, I mean, it looked deeper than if I had primed black, absolutely, but not in a good way. Uh, but now that we've discussed, you know, when you're making mistakes, that's fine. It's okay to make mistakes. You can correct errors. Uh, unless they're as fundamental as painting a black armored army and priming white. Um, but don't be afraid to put a project down for a bit if it's really frustrating you. This is supposed to be fun. You know, I've had this Gorman DeWolf in progress for 15 years. That sucks, but uh, I'm gonna finish him someday. I swear it. And frankly, the big thing that was really stopping me from continuing on this project was I didn't know what I wanted to do with some of his colors, especially the inside of his cloak. And I was like, well, what if it's this like bluish white sort of thing, like it was a rabbit fur lining or something. I'm not going to try to give it a rabbit fur texture because uh, my life's too short. But now that I've got that in there, I feel good about it. I feel like I can keep going. Uh, I also didn't know what to do with this skirt, but then I was like, wait a minute, wouldn't that just be the same kind of green rubber that he's using to protect his face and hands? Because he's just hanging all of these jars right over it. So the story led me to the right decision there. Oh, Chop and Stance definitely understands leaving a project for like 15 years. I salute you. 
and you know his boots I'm just I'm gonna do black I think I've got uh, some GW contrast black going and I'm just gonna slap it on these and see what it does and if it needs work I'll work on it and if it doesn't need work hey <laughs> it's gonna be nice but uh, now to show the actual minis from Tails. I don't know as I've shown you this on stream yet. This is Eve. And I'm pretty happy with the way this Eve is turning out. I've actually done two Eves. And if you can tell the difference between them, then you are very smart and observant and have been paying attention. been trying to paint these two in parallel with more or less the same techniques and try to get them to the same level of completion. Let's see if I can get the light and the focus to agree. So I've got a little bit of a gem dot on the end of her orbs here for her staff. Eve's a model where you're really having a dark night of the soul while you do these purple colors because of course one, it's purple against purple, so I have to do everything in my power to try to make those purples stand out against each other. Um, could have tried to go a little harder with this one, but I think it still works out. Um, I think this one, there's her skirt flap there, stands out better than this one's. So I'd try to hit this one with a couple of uh, probably darker or mid-tone wash of that purple get it to stand out against the brighter, redder purple of her overskirt and bodice. And gloves, actually. But once you get those purples down and you start with the gold details, the model really starts to come together and look nice. So for her, next steps are doing that black haft of her her sorceress staff, and then her skin, hair, and eyes. And I don't really feel like doing eyes on her yet. Um, not until I get the skin down on it. Deirdre, I worked ahead a little bit on from last week. I have the camera on a fixed focus, but here we go. I gave her some blue eyebrows because even though in the art her eyebrows are usually a more natural color, so to speak, on the model I was like, eh, it's gonna, it's gonna be fun if I give her blue eyebrows. Maybe I'll go on it with some darker blue and make it look kind of blue-black, but I wanted it to look like it belonged there. I think I maybe hit her hair highlights again. And of course, I have done the base coat of her skin. So for this skin, I probably want to go in and lighten it up quite a bit. Then maybe do a little bit of a tone wash to bring it down just a little bit. Um, I try to go pretty gently when it comes to bringing skin tones back down. Because I don't really want it to look lumpy, I think is about the best I can describe it. I've went in and I've given her necklace that first little hit of gold, including the little strand there, which, oh my god. Um, that definitely requires that needle-thin brush to do. Yeah, I don't feel like suffering on camera, so I'm not going to do her eyes today either, but I am going to see if I can't get her skin highlights going. So this is a pale elf highlight that I made myself when I started painting again after a long, long break. I opened up my paint kit and I found this bottle and it was just like this 
and I put some in my palette and I was like, I, is this g glue? Is this paint? What did I make this for? Why is this here? Oh, clog. However, that does mean that that inside of the cap is nice and clean because it all came off on the dropper bottle. Which I definitely prefer to the alternative. Hmm. That's it there. Can I? Oh, all right, cool. It's actually going to flow. That's great. Now this stuff's already pretty thin in the bottle. So I'm not sure if I want to go and do any other thinning. I'll show you here on the thing. Eh, it's got a little, got a little gooiness to it. I'm not sure if it's easy to see with the camera, but there's kind of a a snake in the water, so to speak. Bring some water into it. Try to bring it back to life. Try to remember where my camera's pointing. Also found this guy, my number zero Windsor Newton Series Seven, which is pretty nice to have. Do I already have a? I already have a little artifact on the brush. It's tough to see, but. Sometimes a tiny, tiny, tiny droplet will dry on the very, very, very end of your paintbrush and create this little ball on a string kind of effect. And that makes the point of your brush not super reliable. So you want to rinse that off. Too close. Try to get that sort of wrist bump there. Hmm, okay, that's very bright. I do want to give this a bit of... Can I show it? There we go. You can just see that bump on her wrist there. Looks a little goofy. Looks a little incorrect. So I'm gonna... See if I can't scrub it a little bit. Bring it down a notch. This is not the Emerald Lagasse painting moment. Okay, cool. I'll get a little bit of mixing medium in there. I'm just going to try to incorporate the mixing medium to the whole pad of skin color that I've got here. There we go. I'll just immediately clean my brush so that there's no paint drying inside the ferrule. Because remember, 
that ruins your brush. And then let's get back into it. So I want to kind of get the raised portions of her fingers. Get her knuckles. And then sort of the tendony range for those knuckles. Meet with the rest of the hand. Try to call out that thumb bump a little bit. Right. Right there. It's a little gentle on the sculpt, but I'm going to try to brighten it, make it a little more exciting. Oh, hello, Domestics. Welcome to the stream. In case you missed the intro, today I'm trying to talk about tenacity and completion of your models. So I'm going to try and do a couple things I've been putting off, namely Deirdre's skin, while I talk about finishing guys. Guys being, in this case, a neutral term for any little metal or plastic figure. Gotta get these bright forehead. Let's roll it down the nose there. A little bit of brightness on her chin. I'm gonna focus on her hands a bit more with this. Pardon me, I've got a Grab that little little droplet off of the end of the bristles there. So I want to see if I can't experiment with uh, with changing the uh, the arrangement of when I paint what part of somebody's face. I'm going to see if I can't put the eyes in before I finish up the skin. Or at least the skin of her face. In this one you can kind of see her, her fingernails on the model. Right there, and I'm going to leave those alone for now. I've got a plan those. Paint's getting a little dry on the brush. Time to clean it off, go back in. It's a little frustrating to have to start over so many times, but uh, well, that's what patience is for. Uh. One little note on completion that I can say is completion starts at the beginning, uh, especially when it comes to sort of assigning goals for yourself, and figuring out not just that you want to paint a mini and how you want to paint a mini, but how much time you want to spend on it. Because time equals effort and effort equals overall quality of the model. So, do 
you want to be painting a mini for an hour, two, ten, more. Once you know the basics and you're pretty confident in how you paint, try defining how long you want to spend on a specific mini and see what happens. You don't have to like Iron Man commit to it. Just be like, I want to see what this model looks like after I've spent four hours painting it. Right, or how much, how close I can get this model to finished in just one hour. And figure out what kind of pace you're actually comfortable with what kind of techniques maybe help you get there. Because once you know that, you can do a lot better in planning. Some painters put as many as 100 hours into one model, which is just bonkers to me. My average for a, a hashtag effort level model, it's about eight hours. And my speedier models are done probably in about four, maybe six. I'm going to be frank, I don't speed paint a whole lot. Let's see here. Once you start asking yourself, how much time do I really want to sink into this? A few things that can help you make that decision are, you know, how much do you care about this model specifically? Does this model have to really stand on its own? Does it have to be kind of alone on the field? I'm going to try to do this in the stripes and give Deirdre a little secret muscle definition. Because she's our frontline cleric. the camera more. Life's tough that way. And probably just get the tops of the ears just a just a little hit. pretty cautious, trying to arrange things so that I can pull inward, for stability's sake. Yeah, that's about as good as I like. And if a model is just one model amongst a little army, you know, if you're fielding five of this guy at a time, you can you can cut some corners. You can take some shortcuts. In fact, you might not want to go too hard on particular details or distinctions on one particular model inside of a unit, because what you really want to focus on is how they all look together. You want to focus on the cohesion visually of that unit. Now, you might want to make sure that that unit is quick to distinguish from other units you might be fielding at the same time. But, uh, for instance, like let's say that you're rocking a paint scheme for your army that is green, taupe, and purple for some reason, right? And your cavalry can have maybe taupe leathers and armor and purple detail points and highlights for some things, and then green for their saddlebags, what have you. And then for, say, skirmishers, these guys are completely mad lads, and they want purple armor, 
and they can have green boots and taupe whatever else, you know? <laughs> yes, for, for Tails itself, um, you're in trouble. You're, there's no armies, there's no... Well, these two guys need to look practically identical and you don't need to put a lot of effort into them. Because, you know, everybody's somebody's precious character. You know, Deirdre's... Deirdre's my favorite. And Eve is my favorite. And Zot's my favorite. And I love them all and they need to look good. So some... Some models, some mini painting is just going to kind of be like that. Sometimes you're not going to have an easy out. Hmm. Looking over here at my paints to try and see if I can't find something that looks like it'll give me a nice rosy color. I don't really want to jump right into a red. Ugh, well, this isn't much better. But screaming pink. I just want the tiniest, tiniest dot of my palette here. There we go. You didn't see that. You need to see how how tiny this dot is. Boom. I don't want this red to take over the skin tone. But I want a warmer wash. I want something that I can use to highlight those sort of pinked up parts of Deirdre's skin. You know, like the... I have a hard time pointing it at the camera, but like... You know, a flexed knuckle looks pink. Not in this light, though. Her lips can look a little pink, although I am not going to give her the makeup look. Can't mix any of the skin tone into this. up even further. Mm. I feel almost like I want to even add just a little more glaze. I'm going to put the glaze over here so that I don't overdo it. Take a more ready flesh tone. Maybe bronze. I have it over here. Come on. Oh, it's clogged. Needle time. Oh, oh god. Oh no. Everything's wrong. Everything is bad. The dropper bottle is under pressure, everyone. That's uh, one of the hazards of dropper bottles. I still way prefer dropper bottles to flip tops though. Paint pots. I've heard people defend paint pots by saying, well, you know, with droppers it can really suck to not put down enough paint and then have to go back and get more of the paint. I've just never had good luck with paint pots not tipping over on me or clogging in a terrible way. <laughs> uh, 
Alucardex says, uh, why is Jen moving in the video? I'm used to her being frozen. Um, me too. Uh, no, we figured out that, uh, that my video was fighting for my GPU with, um, with Tabletop Simulator. So I just turned Zoom up around and said, hey Zoom, don't, don't try to hug my GPU. That is for Tabletop Simulator to waste. Uh, and it's been fixed ever since, although I'm not running Tabletop Simulator right now, so double bonus. All right, let's, let's get a little pink up onto Deirdre here. Let's just hit her knuckles right here. But I kind of want to just go over the wrist a little bit for now. It's very subtle. I might have to come back and do that again. This one, the largest knuckles are actually here and not the highest point. Let me try to get them like that. And then here the, the webbing of her thumb is gonna be a little bit a little bit pinked out. A little bit of that translucent pink. Kind of use it to shade her ears too. It's like I'm giving her a wet willy. But I promise I would never do that. lips here. Just a little bit on the cheeks. The other side is just kind of invisible looking. A little bit on the chest. I'm going to go a little harder on the chest. Just kind of kind of back off with the back of her hand here. And try to give that a look. Things look good. I'm also going to try to get a good dot of this on each of her fingernails that are exposed here. So I tend to notice that those look pretty pinkish. IRL. Kind of too thinned out to see. I'll probably have to do a couple of coats. But first, I'm going to let it dry so that I don't undo any of my hard work. So, next up, I think I'm going to take Eve off of this paint handle here, put Gurky on it instead. And see if I can't get this scarf looking a little bit more complete. Take 
goblin green. Drop that down here on the other side, away from all of my pinks and blues. There we go. Let's go a little harder. I realize I don't have a lot of bright or high key greens to use right now. I'm noticing all these little gaps in my paint collection. Which feels weird because uh, I'm gonna... there you go. That, that represents only two thirds of my paint collection. And yet still, I'm like, man, I could, I could use one of these. I could use one of those. You can make it a very long way, though, in painting just blending colors. Although I recommend not paint, not blending. Don't blend to make purples unless you've got some base purples to start with. You know, I would say three purples of different uh, values will take you where you need to go. Um, don't blend to get browns either. You're like, but brown is what you can make out of anything. Just because you can doesn't mean you can do so consistently unless you take very good notes while you're mixing paint. Uh, so I recommend probably having a really broad array of browns. You're going to be like, why do I have six colors of brown? Technically nine. I have nine browns. Four of them are skin colors. Um, the rest of them are also skin colors in waiting. <laughs> also they're leathers. Also they're this. That's why. Um, and because there are those kinds of tones, and because browns have a range of warmth and coolness to them. Uh, you're going to want to use pre-made browns so that you're not trying to mix a, a brown of one particular value, that's, that's its lightness or darkness, and you hit it, but now you have the wrong color temperature. So you're trying to blend a warm brown over a cool one, and then it ends up looking weird and kind of like it's not the same, like it's not a good highlight, that would be why. Uh, let's see here. I think I want a little bit of glowing paper on this green. willing to hunt for my paint, so I'm just going to let that slide. So once you've figured out, okay, well I want this mini to look about this good. I'm willing to put about this much time and effort into it. Um, one thing that I want to sort of stress for you is that uh, strong ideas are a lot more important, especially in the beginning and mid-range of skill, than strong techniques. Strong ideas, bigger and better than strong techniques. Um, if you've got a big idea for a model or a base or a color scheme, then even the most bare bones execution is going to have a lot of impact on the model. And I'll have a few things to show you once we start talking about basing. Hint, hint, that's something we're going to talk about next, soon-ish. Let's get paint on Gerky. Oh, to use an angle I don't like so that you can see it. But I'm doing it for you because you're worth it. There we go. I like it. The 
This is turning out to be a pretty good mid-tone. Because it's nice and translucent, I'm not super scared about hitting the whole surface with this mid-tone. If I get it too thick on a particular area, I can still draw that off with my brush while it's drying, but definitely before it's dry. And if it's translucent enough, and it's not too far from the low lights, from the shades, And the shades should actually sort of shine through this lighter color without a whole lot of effort. I can do some of that work for you. I'm noticing that it looks a little like it's pooling here, so I'm going to clean off my brush. Go in there and try to bring those shades back. but I wouldn't panic about something like this because honestly, if you need to bring the shades back, you can just go back in with a little wash of a dark color. And then it's Hello Darks again. going with the same green progression on his little on his little flap here we'll see if turning him on the painting base here is gonna make that a bit more visible for you a little bit I'm struggling to get it both in the light for me and in the camera for you. Kind of not happening. So I'm just going to go in there dirty and then show you the results. Gertie's just holding his knife o over that into the light making it tough to see. But I like how much brighter that green is now. Sweet. Gonna let him dry for a minute. I'll give that same treatment to the Gherky that I did with a Zenithal Highlighting uh, Prime. If you missed me talking about this subject in previous videos, uh, zenithal highlighting is sort of an undercoating technique where you prime the model in black or gray, and then you hit it with white from uh, from the light source, really. You know, Gherky's lit from above like this, so you spray from above like so, and you, you know, go and give it a little bit of love around the face and other spotlight areas where people are going to look hard. And that's a little fake, but uh, so is all art. Sometimes you have to make concessions for your audience. This scarf here is definitely looking Good. I like the color, but it's going to need a dark wash. That's fine. Cool. There he is. Right. Nice. Oh, I've got that, that little 
droplet on the end of my brush forming again. It's just going to happen. So yeah, but as I've done here, and as you've probably heard me emphasize in streams before, you know, you're starting with the largest volumes on the model, such as the cloak, well, it's the cape, and then the skirt, and the stuff that matches her big boots, her bodice and clothes, and then you work your way down to the smaller volumes. So by the end, when you're trying to get the model finished, what you're ending up working on is detail work. So jewelry, little poppin' bits. You know, I think now's a good time to get the stage done. Let's hit that. I actually do have black paint proof. So to speak. It's a relatively unclogged shape. What's coming out of it is kind of more clay like than paint like, which uh, means that this paint stays remembered. I absolutely had to get rid of a wolf gray, I think earlier last week because uh, it's just clay on the inside. I was like, man, maybe there's, maybe the clog is deeper in the nozzle than I thought, and it's just re-clogging itself after I free it up with the needle, so I opened the bottle up and mm -mm. it's clogs all the way down. But that's about what it takes for me to get rid of a bottle of paint. I do not like wasting paint. Thinning the black down again with glazing medium because I have a sickness and the only cure is more glazing medium. Which means that this black's probably going to go on in two coats. Oh well, so be it. It's a little awkward. At the end of the gold cuff near Eve's body doesn't really have a distinct form of its own delineating the beginning of that part and the end of the regular shaft. Which means that I've kind of got to go in there and decide on my own where I think that starts. Hey, this is the, the Zenithal one, so once I get to a certain point on the top, I don't have to mess around on the bottom. Getting the black paint on. Muddy there. Ugh, nope, I screwed it up. So I was trying to smooth out this part, and instead I made it worse. But that's fine, because we're going to cover up that sin with more paint. 
just like in real life. I'll put a little flow improver on here to see if I can't make it a little bit smoother. So when you're doing detail work, it can help a lot to just step away midway through the detail work and come back when you've got a little bit more energy for it. And also, frankly, to come back when uh, your eyes have adjusted. So I find if I'm working on the same details for very long, uh, my eyes start to get a little weird about what I'm seeing and other details that are very close to the details that I've been working on they just become sort of invisible to me and so I need that break so that I can <laughs> wizard eyes yeah come closer my old wizard eyes are failing me but in a magical way, so don't make fun of me. Um, but you know, after a break, I'll see things that I really wasn't seeing before, just because my brain was deciding, hey, you're paying attention to this and this and this, and none of this other stuff. Now that does mean that you'll probably come back after a break and go, ah, oh, damn it. I didn't do this guy's belt buckle, I didn't do this. Um, there's a spot on so-and-so's weapon that I really wanted to hit with this color. You, you didn't hit it the first time, but you've given yourself a chance to hit it the second time. As long as you haven't really finished by putting the seal on it, you still have room to make it better. Now this one I painted with just a fully white undercoat. So the colors are very nice. It does mean that I have to get this black all over the haft of the weapon here. And I've thinned it so much that it's basically like a wash. Oops. It's okay though. I think it's even more important that it looks even on this one because we don't have that black undercoat. Very careful as I get close to that glove. Yeah, her glove's a dark color, but still. No, the paint handle's in the way, but rest assured, I'm painting. Kotaku article exposed. Jen actually not painting. Two seconds out of painting stream. Yeah, it's still a little splotchy. That's probably going to take three coats. Yeah, once you can't find unpainted bits or surfaces where you want to push the highlight or engage in any other little painting effect anymore, once you really give that model a once-over and go, mm, I, I think there's nothing more to add, then uh, congratulations, you did it at that point. You have finished the model. And 
you can take a couple of looks to really go, mm, yeah, I think I am done. And that's perfectly fine. Me. I just really want to get this coat on nicely. A little bit more here. A little bit more here. You can see it. I'm trying to push a little bit right into that uh, lever for thumb. And then there's kind of a lot of black paint just chilling right here. I think I'm going to take just a little bit of it out. Maybe that was too much, but we'll find out later. So once you're done, what, what do you do? What do you actually engage in in order to finish finish the model well if you've got basing that you're doing uh, and your basing involves like grass or flocking then once you're done painting is when to do that I'm gonna just cover these while I yak because we're going to be doing a little bit of basing show and tell for a minute So, it's a mini that I haven't shown off during the stream. Definitely Gog. Big, beautiful Gog. So here is a completed Gog mini from an older, uh, an older version of the models. So, so here's the old version. Our sculptor went back and was like, I want to make the sculpts more awesome. So here's... Here's the new version. Oh lord, he goggin'. He sure is. Him and his big axe are coming to get you. You'll also notice that the scale is a bit different. Um, when we got the prototypes for this, we got to looking at them and going, these are, these are too small, bigger, more, more model. Um, but you'll see on finished Gog's base here, I've got a few things going on. I've got sort of a brown grit, and then I've got a little bit of light green flock, and then sort of a drier grass looking effect that you'll see is kind of tuftier. This is a mix of flocking and static grass. Uh, but you do these last because, frankly, there's just, there's just no way to paint it. It's not a good idea. What I'll typically do is take a little tray like this and get some glue on the base and then just dip it in and shake it around until I've got the coat that I want in the desired thickness. And maybe you might need to do it in a couple of layers you know, if you can still see something underneath the flock that's not really jiving with your intent, just put on another coat of paint once that flock and the original glue is dried. Did I say paint? I meant glue. Put another layer of glue over that flock, dip it again, let it go. Um, with the static grass, you're actually going to be probably using super glue and uh, tweezers. So you'll put a little drop of super glue down on it, or maybe some wood glue, and then you just apply it with the tweezers. And then uh, give it a little puff and let that glue dry. Demystics chiming in. Used to put glue on and dip the base in sand and paint it goblin green back in the 90s. That looks pretty 
pretty solid. I mean, it has a texture to it. Um, I have a quick grit that I use, which is this really, really fine white sand. Like, like looks like flour is sand uh, mixed with regular old big grainy sand. And a bit of, um, what do they call it, talus? Um, very small fake rock. And then once those are all, because they're all mixed together, you get this really nice varied effect, um, but without a lot of effort because I'm lazy. Uh, I also started using this stuff sometimes for my basing. Um, although it is already a brown earth color, if you want to see what it looks like inside, it's a uh, is doo-doo. But uh, I'll actually use this before I prime my model to give the base itself some nice gritty, dirty texture. And then later I paint it brown again, if I need it to be brown. <laughs> um, Demystics also says, I like that Citadel cracking paint stuff. I use it on my ultramarine bases with a little static grass. I'm not sure I've seen that stuff in action, actually. Something I might have to go looking at. Oh, excuse me, everyone. Got a little hiccuping going on. Let's see here. Just gonna Google it. Cookie settings. Well, their website isn't exactly deeply navigable, but it looks nice. So that's uh, one plus for them. I'll look at it later. Makes it look a bit like an arid wasteland. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, reminds me of like crackle nail polish, just to be a total girl about it. You know, right? You do a base coat and then you do the crackle coat over the top. Is this a two? two pot, two coat product, or is it a one bottle product? So if they get something like that out of just one bottle, that's kind of cool. One bottle, wow, that is cool. Oh, anyways, once you've got your basing and your grasses set where you want it, uh, you should give it a clear varnish coat. Um, I've used typical, like, art preservation coats before, and those can be a little dodgy. Um, if you want to just use what Army Painter and GW want to sell you, that's cool, go for it. Um, I actually have a bottle. It's all the way across the room, so I'm not going to grab it, but uh, I bought a canister of Mr. Super Clear Matte Spray from, uh, it's, you might be able to guess, it is a Japanese craft hobby thing for use on, like, Gundam models. So, very curious to see how that performs. Uh, what kind of varnish should you use outside of brand? Mr. Hobby stuff is good. I'll have to look into that. Um, when you're varnishing your models, you're looking for probably a matte finish in practically all applications. Um, maybe satin, uh, if you're feeling a bit spicy. Uh, I don't recommend glossy varnishes for models because then what happens is the models are very shiny and you can't actually see the highlights that you painted onto the model because they are so busy shining. Uh, why is that bad? They're going to be different shining parts. Uh, God, 
However, gloss looks, gloss gives you more color depth and matte makes the color look a lot flatter. So you might want to go from matte to gloss in some situations. Uh, you might want to use gloss to make certain parts of the model pop in a different way, like I plan to do with, for instance, Deirdre's hair. Uh, Demystic says, uh, I've heard doing a gloss coat and then a matte coat avoids frosting. That's cool. Um, I'm always a little nervous about going too hard on the varnish and making the model look a little blobby, but but frosting on your varnish is bad. Um, so preventing frosting on your varnish, I mean, part one is you need to do the same precautions that you do when you're doing priming, which is one, shake the can for a full minute. Not what you feel is a minute, not what you wish was a minute, a full minute. Shake the can until you get really bored. Frosting on your cake is good. Frosting on your models is bad. Uh, so same with, same with your varnish. Just shake the crap out of that can. Shake it until you are certain you can shake it no more. Um, and then, you know, once again, you take the model, you hold, you hold the spray like six to eight inches away from it, you start off the model, you go across the model, you end off the model. Um, and go ahead and take it slow. Also, I'm not a big believer in this for primer, um, because if you've shaken primer properly, the relative humidity in the air isn't really going to get you but maybe don't varnish your models in high humidity. If it's gonna rain today, wait to varnish your models till tomorrow. Because, uh, yeah, if you frost, if you're, what do I mean when I say that uh, the varnish gets frosty? Uh, I mean that it is not clear. Instead, it is like a vaguely translucent white. It really wrecks your work. If you can't get that clear by zapping it with another coat of varnish later, then you've got to start over. You've got to strip the model. Um, so if you want to test your varnish on something else first, if you're feeling nervous about it, if you put a lot of work into the model, do that. Trust your gut. Um, don't be like, oh, I'm being silly. Maybe I shouldn't be cautious. Go ahead and be cautious. You're, you're wasting a little bit of spray varnish. It doesn't matter. What matters is wasting hours of your time. So, you know, be nice, be safe, be thoughtful. And now I want to show and tell a little bit. So back to talking about how a big idea is worth a bit more than a big technique. Here is an Anima Tactics mini that I painted years ago. And it's a pretty good paint job. It's another, you know, purple, AKA my personal Waterloo for blending. Um, but I think I did a good job highlighting parts. It's a nice satiny varnish on him. And he's got some nice white hair on his temples and a bit of a salt and pepper mustache and uh, goatee. But very, very simple paint scheme. Um, I've also actually gloss varnished his boots so that they look like a particularly polished leather. But the big star of this model is the base. So for this base, uh, I actually built these wooden planks that are beneath his feet here by taking craft hobby sticks and using my side cutters to chop them down into smaller bits and then taking a razor blade and shaving them into quarters of width and gluing those down. 
and then hitting them with probably my brown wash, maybe maybe a product like this, a, a Vallejo transparent wood grain. Oh my goodness, I just noticed everyone. Somebody call Vallejo. Wook grain. My brain has been correcting that error, error for years now, but uh, but I'm gonna call the typo police. And then his story is that he's some powerful telekinetic psychic dude, right? And so I saw him and his pose and how his his coat was dramatically billowing behind him. See, he's jelly. Nice. Um, and I thought, well, that's cool. That's super anime. But when somebody's doing something like this, I've seen, I've seen stuff in anime where it's like an old dude with a lot of power, like taps his cane on the floor and then something explodes out from him and creates a big scene. So I wanted that in this mini, uh, and what I did was I took little off cuts of that same hobby craft sticks, and also bits that uh, bits that I messed up on and didn't look so good. Because whatever, these guys are exploding. They don't have to look like perfect planks anymore. They've been exploded with psychic mind power. Um, I took a piece of paper and I made a little cone. Uh, and then I carefully lined that, carefully, mm, lining isn't the right word. I made sure that the paper itself was coated with petroleum jelly. Wow, their website called it wood grain, but the picture clearly shows that the bottle still says wood grain. They're focusing on what counts, people, I guess. Detail-oriented folks. Oh, that's funny though. So once I have the cone of paper and I have it coated with Vaseline, uh, that means that I can actually go in and drop little wood chips in to that cone and super glue them together. And the super glue won't go through the Vaseline. So once the super glue is dry, I can tear the cone apart and that paper isn't stuck to my little wooden bits. And then I glue the wooden bits down onto the base for the for the sort of start of the explosion. And once I have the start in, I just glue other bits down around it following that shape. And it created an effect that I'm still really pleased with to this day. And, you know, I can still find stuff on this model where I'm like, well, I could have done this better, but... But man, I love that explosion. I love, I love the burst. Another thing that you can do with your basing is uh, say, screw it, I'm not going to sculpt anything. I'm going to use a pre-made base, because there are lots of industrious folks out there making cool pre-made bases that, for instance, look like bits of rubble and station. Uh, statuary. And you can just plomp your model right down on it and uh, and just have an awesome looking base. This guy's not finished. I need to really, I need to make that stone foot pop more. This is a model where I really went in and all I knew for sure was that I wanted the cape to be red. And I didn't do a very good job planning the rest of the color scheme. So, so a lot of the other things in here don't really pop, they don't look super distinct, but that red cape really says red cape. But I think I've got a couple of ideas of how to fix this. We'll see. Uh, this was also my first experiment with zenithal undercoating, which looks really good on the cape and kind of okay on everything else. It's a learning experience and I really enjoyed being able to put something on one of these bases that I got ages ago. 
Happy Mystic says, I got a base topper Kickstarter, so I have a ton of 3D files for just toppers to put on bases. Just in case I need another reason to want a 3D printer. Uh, actually, here's something. So here is a sort of, oh, it looks really greenish to me in this light today. But this is a fire template guy that fits down in a 28 millimeter base, just like so. Um, for this guy, I've, uh, I've carved out space for the feet of the model that I'm eventually going to put on top of it. I haven't attached the model to the base yet because I don't want to prime over this really neat translucent fire effect. And I don't want to get any paint on it either. So uh, this is going to come together right near the end, probably. Uh, probably got to prime this uh, probably gray and then maybe do a nice undercoat of red around this little circle and put it all together and then probably hit this with a red ink or maybe an orange ink and then a red ink to get a lot of depth out of this really cool effect. It's going to look like I've got a sorcerer surrounded by fire. But you know, if you can't make your own sorcerer's fire, store-bought is fine. And I'm excited to give that ease, right? It's just cool. I was like, oh, what am I, what am I ever going to use that? I had no idea. I bought it anyway. Eventually, it comes together. Uh, what's another simple base job? I mean, Gorman here has got my simple standard base job where I have cobblestones that I've laid out. You know, a few of them are kind of in a regular order, and then a few of them are kind of broken out, like uh, like my mercenary army is crossing broken roads was kind of my thought, my theme. And I've got a nice variety of little stones and grit on the base. So for that, when I'm done, uh, it's really just a matter of figuring out where the flocking goes and making sure that these guys are painted in probably, you know, two, maybe three different vaguely related stone colors. It'll make that look really nice. And then, uh, as you can tell, this was primed white. Once I'm done getting all of this painted up the way I need it to look, I'll have to go over this with black to make it look presentable and finished. And then I hit it with the varnish, hit these little bottles probably with something glossy. I might hit the rubber gloves with something glossy too, but maybe I'll go with satin. Who can say? After that, I can put it on my shelf and be like, I did it. And really having little toys to try it out and go, look guys, I did a thing. And that's what we all do this for. Or put them on the table and go, look at my character. They're awesome. I mean, that's just pure motivation right there. So how much should you baby your finished models once you've got them finished, based, varnished, ready to rock? Um, professional cases are made all the time. Uh, you can get pluck foam in multiple heights. So like one inch, one and a half, two, two and a half for the really big boys, more like three, three and a half. It's all over the place. Um, I find that a little bit expensive and kind of big and inflexible. So honestly, I'll sometimes just take oof, camera strike. I'll take little chips of foam because I get foam all the time from copies of REI5 that got torn to pieces. And I'll just take a little Tupperware and I'll just dump the foam into the Tupperware and sort it around the models until I can be pretty sure they're not going to knock into each other, right? 
because that's the big part of keeping these minis safe is making sure that nothing's knocking into them and they're not knocking into anything else. Um, the plastic minis and the paint job on them are going to be a bit more durable to gentle bumping than metal minis with the same kind of paint job and finish. Um, and that just has to do with um, the strength of the material underneath the paint being different from that strength of the paint itself. So the paint is relatively durable and flexible, but if what's underneath it is kind of durable but inflexible, then when they're bumped into, the paint's going to warp more than what's underneath and creates a bit more chipping. Metal is also usually heavier, which is going to create more force if you drop it. So, you know, just, just be careful. Um, if you're going to show off your models to the youngs, do it over a table where they can only drop it by like two or three inches. Um, otherwise, uh, when it comes to maybe cheap ways to store it, I already showed you one. Um, I have a lot of friends who used to use gun cases for theirs because a lot of those come with uh, eggshell foam, right? And if you can just get eggshell foam by itself and cut that to shape or size for whatever boxes you've got, that's going to do really well for you. But, uh, but the Humble Tupperware has gotten a lot of my minis to conventions and back quite safely. And once you've got them all packed away, like, never look back. Uh, when your mini's done, let it be done. Perfect is the enemy of good. Let your older minis represent kind of a history of how you've improved over time. And, and move on. Like, maybe if you get a really big idea for redoing a paint job, or you want to learn how to strip and repaint models, because that's a whole different topic, then maybe go back on something. But finished is finished. Be happy. It's, you did it. F. Get my palette open here again. Unless I can't. There we go. Don't put wet palette lids on backwards, kids. Get this slipped into my oak shirt. Demystics has just suggested uh, putting magnets on the mini base and then using those magnets to just attach them to dollar store baking trays. That's pretty handy if you're in a situation where keeping the model themselves out in the open is kind of a smart idea for you. Um, for my own part, I kind of like my minis to be enclosed in something, both because my brain just thinks that that is safe and also because I don't want them to get dusty because cleaning a finished model is pain. But, uh, but I think that that is a great way to transport minis from like a one table to another. Like if you're wargaming all day and you can just securely magnet attach your minis to your tray to take them from place to place, that's great. It's a really handy way to do that. Um, I think that I've seen display trays, right? They're, they're typically made out of cork or medium density fiberboard, and it's layers of that with circular holes cut out of the topmost layers for your bases to just perfectly slot into. And sometimes those are magnetized. Um, I think that that's probably the best way to do those. But I've never really desired for anything like that myself. Oh yeah, this is 
kind of looking like this is going to be four coats. When keeping it thin goes wrong. friend who's really obsessed with putting magnets in his minis but like in a cool way not not in an unhealthy way like he plays a lot of blood bowl and so he's got the ball and the ball has a magnet in it and the base of every figure in his team has a magnet in it That way the ball can just get stuck right on the base. You don't have to have any arguments about who's got the ball. Or how to signify who has the ball. And it looks quite nice. He also does a certain amount of um, magnet conversion. So if, uh, if a unit in one of his armies has two different gun options and, you know, they both come in the box set, then he'll just magnetize the guns so that you can just hot swap them with magnets. Yeah, tiny mini, mini magnets are pretty cool. Yep, yep. Um, I've actually used tiny, like, high-strength magnets, but I use them in paper craft to hold particularly small folds of paper together so that I don't have to cramp my hand using tweezers on the same piece of paper for five minutes. Ain't nobody got time for that. So, uh, so instead I let those little magnets do the work. a little bit of white that didn't get covered last time. Yeah. Let's get you there. Yeah, I have to imagine that uh, the Blood Bowl base and ball conversion is just really, really popular because that's just convenient. Yeah, it's just clever. There we go. That's looking pretty good. Man, interchangeable parts on models. I don't know, I might have to try that someday, but I've never really had a MIDI where I would care to do that. But maybe someday. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Sam's pointing out uh, war games that have formations for minis. So if you have a formation board, you can just have the magnets in their bases to snap them onto their formation board. Real convenient, like. There's just, just a lot of ways to do it. Um, Back when I had War Machine minis, uh, and I had my Retribution army, I got that big, fat Retribution guy, and like literally it's about this big, just the body of it, and then it has those insect-like legs and three dudes chanting all around it. Um, I can't remember what it's called. But it would have been pretty handy to magnetize those legs, maybe? And use, use that to take them off for storage. Maybe they would store a little better. As it is, I got a whole makeup box that was like 8 inches cubed. Just for that one mini. Speaking of 
one special mini. Here's Pookie! That we unlocked Sunday. So this is the old version of the sculpt that I finished painting. Gave him a little basing. He's even got a little dot of pinkish red for his eyes and little pink claws like he do in his art sometimes. And uh, a little bit of wash to pop out his little angry brows. But uh, with these prototypes, like one, too small, even for Pookie, and two, his little feet aren't really much of a contact point on the base, so a lot of Pookies ended up falling off of their bases. Mucking around with them. The most fragile of ankles. Tender. And small. So here is the new Pookie model. This little guy here, uh, he's he is poster tacked onto the end of a chopstick so that I can actually paint him. And bathed in too much light. Maybe, there we go. Here's his angry little teeth. Not much more about the sculpt has changed, really, except giving him that swoosh of color and motion that is going to keep his tiny little bunny ankles from snapping and peeling off of his base. So I'll probably give this one a nice little detail wash and then start painting him up over the week. But I'm happy that I can now show him on stream because uh, he's cute. He's a good model. Keaton did a very good job with our Pookie. Our mascot. Alright, I think I've been jabbing enough. I can put another coat of black on this eve. Now one thing that I hear from reluctant painters is, you know, I really like this mini. It's so cool. I don't want to ruin this cool mini with a bad paint job. But, uh, honestly, no paint at all is the true desolation. It's very difficult to actually ruin, ruin a model with your paint job. Like, honest. Even, even some of the worst paint jobs, they're still paint jobs, you know? They're still, they're still good in their own way. They still create visual distinction on the model that wouldn't otherwise be there. So don't don't be intimidated by how cool a model is. You're cool too. If you give it a little time and put in the effort and let yourself have fun with it. then you and that mini are going to have fun together. And it's an inanimate object, so it'll put up with whatever you do to it. Yep, Chop and Stance is chiming in, seeing a few videos. Even just a nice wash elevates a, a base to cool. Like... Like, this is a white prime and then a generous coat of a particular brown wash that I make myself. Right, just for a starting point that I like for models. Um, I call this starting wash my detail wash, so that I can see where all of the details that I want to hit actually are, because otherwise I have trouble. Um... 
and I show this to people and they ask me, whoa, is that finished? That looks really good. So, I mean, I feel a little weird about it because I'm like, well, this is, this is the starting line. Like, the starting gun hasn't even fired on this race, uh, but, but it looks good. It brings out what makes this model and this sculpt good. So, if this makes you happy, this is really easy to do. Uh, if you want to do some color stuff, hit things with some colors, then hit it with a wash. Um, Army Painter makes this strong tone, um, which I recommend. They also make like a medium tone and sort of a lighter or flesh tone. Um, and these are really good. These are a really good way to push a lot of shading into your mini without doing a lot of layering effort. Oh. Chop and Stance, you wanna wanna wash your little 3D Fort alcohol markers? Yeah, I've got I've got a set. Once again, they're across the room so I can't grab them because I have a camera strapped to my chest. But uh, they look good in just one coat of wash. And Gog is just so handsome. He's just, he's a big, beautiful boy. And his mom knit him a very nice sweater for a reason. It's because he's very lovable. And, you know, what if he got cold? Um, but yeah, like the gouges and the axe already look really great and dramatic. And if you want to leave something like this here, that's great. If you want to push it further, that's great too. And in fact, now that I think I've got the staves on Eve's wand, basically the kind of black that I want them to be. Oof. We'll say the one thing that's kind of negative about these paint handles is if you're not careful removing the model, um, you're going to yeet it across the room. So just be cautious. Otherwise, they're basically perfect and God's gift to painters. Thank you, GW. Gonna take this gurky. And I think I'm gonna muck around a little bit. I think I'm gonna paint around and find out. The only thing that I kind of don't like about the Army Painter Strong Tones is that they're in ink. Uh, the thing about inks is that uh, inks dry shiny, so they're glossy which can be kind of distracting on the finished model, but chances are you're going to hit it with a matte varnish when you're done. So not a huge deal. Not in the long run. Can get a pretty good dollop of that on my palette. And then what do I want to thin it with? Just water, medium, You know what, I'm going to use some of the medium that's already here. That I used for creating that blush for Deirdre. Yeah, that's probably a little too much, we'll find out. Speaking of which, I build up for one thing, and then I jump to another thing because ADHD. Going to get a second coat of this pink on Deirdre's knuckles. That first coat's actually looking a lot better than I feared it would. Kind of try to get that little pinky knuckle. And hit that again. We'll hit the webbing of this finger. It's a little, it's a little bit cool up in there because. There's a lot of blue on her model. And then maybe hit those fingernails again. And the thumbnail. It's hard to see, but her thumbnail is taking to this little bit of pink a lot better than the other fingernails. Just 
good. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to get the tip of this ear. A little bit of pink. I think that's going to make it look a little bit more translucent overall. Because skin is translucent, and what's underneath skin is usually blood. Welcome to the totally not a psycho killer portion of uh, painting time. I think I've got another little little droplet on the end of my my brush's point here. Now I think it's gone. Just let's use that slightly diluted army painter strong tone on Gurky's pants. Let's see if I've got a... There we go. If I get my thumb out of the way, it's fine. Just a little less on the brush. And just hit it. And even... You know what? I'm going to go over these two. Screw it. We are doing this live. And over this too, because... Once again, we're, we're doing this live. We're going to go all the way. The bad idea bears are singing to me. I must heed their call. But is it a bad idea if it looks awesome? No. If it looks awesome, then it was a good idea in disguise. down in that, that weird butt space that I can't otherwise see or get to. Just like in real life. Phrasing. And let's get Gurky's knee over here. Boot, which you can't see because Gerke's model is very small, but uh, but there we go. I've hit practically all of that leather. It looked like I had a bubble on that one knee, but uh, I guess I don't. I need to get his vest. And the other side of it too. I'll even use a little bit of it over this green. Try to keep it a bit more distinct from the rest of it. But as this dries, that's going to help even out the tone and make the deeper parts pop a bit more. I'm pleased enough with that to go and grab it. Do this gurky. I'm not even going to use the painting handle on this one. Which means you might be able to see me do some of this. go. With this one, I went a little harder on some of the highlights than the other one. I think that's going to look pretty good. <sighs> well, let's see. Is there anything else I want to do on Nerdy's art right now? Yeah, if I'm not doing the skin, I'm not really doing anything. Let's Let's hit Deirdre with a bit more of that paler skin. Maybe use a little bit more glaze medium in there, make it a bit more translucent. One of the cool things about glazing is if you're feeling nervous about a transition from 
one layer to the next, you can just make it more transparent. Make it a less radical transition. Once you're doing that, it should give you the courage to go on and do that next layer. Definitely going to need to go and make some kind of warmer tan, kind of beach babe sort of color. Give that a nice thin wash over here. Bring some of the highlights down. Hmm. Right now I'm just going in and sort of poking at Deirdre's eyes with a brush with nothing on it as sort of a dry run for how I want to approach doing her eyes in the first place. Kind of figuring out how the brush hits that part of the model before I've got anything on it paint-wise. Hmm. Maybe help me see the best way to actually get in there and get the eye started. Yeah, I think I want a slightly thinner brush for this, but that is a pretty good approach. Her face isn't isn't super closed in. That always makes it a lot harder. Gog, of course, is big and beautiful and doing his eyes is going to be pretty easy even if he's squinting a whole lot, because the approach to his eyes is so simple, you just go right in there. Just great. Zot is... Zot is still quite squinty, but not as squinty as he used to be, and his brow isn't really hanging over his eyes, unlike in the previous sculpt, so I'm not going to have to pretend that his eyes are on his cheeks to paint them. So that's going to be nice. Oh, but I'm winding, winding down. I can smell dinner, which is quite exciting for me. I hope that you guys had fun. I hope that my camera's cable... Oh, it did! It got in some of my paint. So I'm going to clean that up and tidy up my painting workspace and then probably get back to this later in the week for me privately so that I have a little bit more to show you next week, next Tuesday. But this was a fun show. Uh, I really enjoyed doing painting time with you again. This time I'm going to put my paint palette back together correctly. Yes, good. So hopefully I've showed you a few more things that were useful, given you a bit more advice that was heartening. Because I would love to see lots of painted minis from folks who get tails. That's, that's kind of just a secret, not so secret, hope in my heart is that, you know, Two years from now, I'm going to be seeing lots of tweets on our on our Twitter feed saying, hey, look, here's, here's the Zot I painted. Here's the Fiona that I painted. I had to paint this Pookie even though he was small and it was hard. I love seeing what other people do with paint jobs, just in general. And if I had something to do with the minis, then that's double exciting. So I hope that this stuff brings you about as much fun as it does me. I will see you next week. Thank you for joining me. And check out the Kickstarter campaign if you haven't yet. <laughs>